Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome from a rainy and dreary Indianapolis, but that's okay. I got lots of cool things to talk to you about today, and like always, uh, I'm going to be talking about what you guys want to learn about. This is, uh, this is all going to be about questions that you guys sent in today. I've crafted kind of like the, the episode around it, so uh, I guess you have to tell you who I am. I'm Kenny Brown, and this is Cars and Coffee, and if you're a car guy, and want to learn more about cars, real information, not all the BS that floats around the internet, you're in the right place. Because today what we're going to talk about is, uh, what do you think? Is, is DOT for brake fluid good enough for track days? Uh, and then we've got the uh, uh, kind of a dilemma with the IRS Cobras in the back. Is it bump steer or rear steer? And uh, let's see what else. Oh, we've got, uh, yeah, we've got some, some more cool questions. Uh, do you know what a difference is between a, uh, uh, a limited slip and, uh, and a, and a uh, torque sensing differential like torsion? Well, you're going to find out here in a little bit. So if you're just joining us, uh, I'm Kenny Brown. This is Cars and Coffee. And I've been watching, uh, I've been watching a lot of Formula One stuff on YouTube at night. And what I've learned is hit that, hit that button, smash the subscribe and ring the bell. You can tell I've been listening to other YouTube things, but I've been, uh, I, I always watch the, the Formula One stuff on YouTube at night. So uh, Facebook, it, 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 you, can, you can start a uh, watch, uh, watch party with your friends and share. So I got all that stuff in early on. So let's, uh, let's see what we have today. Okay, we're going to start with uh, Herstifer. Uh, Herstifer is uh, an interesting guy. He is a uh, Speed Therapy Academy alumni, uh, and he's in Bulgaria. And he, uh, when we're doing the academy, he will get up at, at 2 o'clock every morning uh, to attend the academy. So he, he's got he's, he's a pretty cool guy. And he's, the academy has helped him out immensely, improving his, his driving and car. But he has a question. He says, I have a question. My S550 rear brake dust boots are cracked and looking like there's and it's looking like there's no other option but to replace the calipers. Any suggestions on how to prevent this from happening again? Okay, I'm guessing that uh, the dust boots are cracking from heat from the brakes. Uh, that's not necessarily uncommon. In fact, uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our people <clears throat> that run like regular high-performance street brakes and on track a lot, do a lot of track days, they actually just completely burn those little rubber boots off. And you look down there, or you see these little tiny fringe of rubber that's still in the caliper. Uh, I mean, it's not a problem because race, race brakes don't come with boots, dust boots, for that very reason. They don't last unless you've got some special, you know, high temperature uh, dust boots. But otherwise, the thing to do is, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just get some brake clean and periodically just, you know, spray them out and keep them clean. Uh, if, if the dust boots are cracked and not working as good, then you need to take over that role and you can do it with, with some brake cleaning. Just, you know, hose, hose out the, you know, the, around the calipers, around the pistons and the caliper. And, uh, yeah, it's, or you can get new brakes, but then if it's the heat that's doing it, you're going to burn up the boots again. Cause I, I don't know that you can actually get dust boots, uh, separate, uh, for, from a Ford caliper. So that's, that's like anybody, if you've got the regular brakes, you burn off your front dust boots, don't worry about it. Just use brake clean, keep them clean, because the whole idea of the dust boots is to keep uh, dusting sand and all that stuff out. So if you, if you keep cleaning it, then you don't have a problem. Okay, Ch uh, Dale, this is a really good question, because I mentioned a Windsor before. Uh, Dale want to know about a Windsor swap in an S197. Uh, I, th I think it's a cool thing. We've actually, uh, I've been working with uh, one of our customers, David, out in California, who is doing that exact same thing. He's building, a, I think it's a 2013 Mustang uh, S S197 into uh, an awesome, I mean, awesome AIX car. And, you know, part of the thing is you want to do something different. So I had uh, a Wagner Race Engines up in Wisconsin build an all aluminum 351 stroke to 408 uh, <coughs> still have that asthma thing <coughs> and it makes un maybe like 650 horsepower and an ungodly amount of torque like almost 600 pounds of torque 
it's going to be a real monster. Now he ran into some issues. Uh, that are unique. There's a lot of a lot of like headers headers that you can put on the 351 in, a, in 197, and we tried what was out there and didn't work. And the reason didn't work because it's dry sump. Okay, there's no oil pan. We dropped the motor way down, and because it's a, it's a, a from scratch build, pushed the motor all the way back, which really kind of limited the real estate for headers. But let me show you. Actually, I, I, I uh, sent him a note and he sent me some pictures. So I thought we would, I would share some of these pictures. Okay, there you can see, I and mean, it's hard to see, but there's there's not a lot of space. When you, when you put the motor down and back, you're losing space for headers. And uh, that's actually the, uh, the dry soap down there, I think. But you can see how tight it is. Okay, got another picture. Okay, that's what it looks like from the top. Uh, he, you can see that the, he's doing an incredibly good job. Uh, you can see how how low and how far back that engine sits. I mean, it is. Uh, this is the front of the motor right here, and that's the uh, the shock tower brace. You can see just how far back uh, the, the motor sits and how low it is. And he 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 said if if you're if you're interested in doing that and want to talk to him, he'd be happy to talk to you about what he did. So. I think this this is this is going to be a, a wicked awesome car. He he's by the way he's got the full uh, uh, Kenny Brown AGS 4.5 suspension system, along with you can see the uh, the canister for the shocks. He's got the Motorsport 11 shocks. So this is this is going to be a wicked wicked fast car. Okay, I think I got got one from the bottom too. Okay, you can see that there's there's the dry sump. We went with the daily dry sump. Uh, you know, I did a lot of research, and the daily blow it up a little bit. And the daily dry sump, hands down, is the best dry sump system out there. But you can see that he, he kind of he had to, he, these headers were custom made, and whoever made them did a really really good job. So. Uh, can you put a Windsor in an S197? Yeah, I mean, if if you when you just drop the engine, nothing on it, just drop the long block in there, it looks lost in a 197. There's so much room. But when you put the engine down and all the way back, then all of a sudden you start running out of real estate uh, for exhaust and other things, and everything has to be custom made. <clears throat> you know, motor mounts, headers. Well, there are some headers out there that I think will work if the engine's in a standard location. But if you start doing race car stuff and move it around, then things kind of change a little bit. Okay, who's up next? <coughs> Gosh, it's darn asthma. I was doing really good on asthma, and then it started raining. That just sets me up. Okay, Rob Kemp. Okay, my next question is rear bumps here on IRS, toe in or toe out. Static settings, what is the desired dynamic toe? Preferably in inches, not degrees. <coughs> the first part of the question. <coughs> okay, that's an interesting question. Uh, what we, what I found a long time ago in, in doing the geometry on the, uh, the IRS cars, and I found it out at Road Atlanta when we were testing with uh, Ford Racing and doing a media event. For the, then the the FR five hundred, which was an SN ninety five, uh, with the double wishbone in the front, and IRS in the back, but that Road Atlanta at, at the other end, there's two right hand turns, and on the second right hand turn, every time I got to the same spot in the track, the back would just get loose, and it did the same thing going under the bridge. Uh, so it went back, and we we had worked really hard to get the, like the camber and all that stuff and roll centers where I wanted them. I really didn't take the time to look at, at the uh, at the uh, the steering in the back. So when I started running some 
some uh, analysis through the computer, I found out that when the, the body got to a certain degree of roll, I don't remember what it is, it was a long time ago, both rear wheels turned the wrong way. So that's, that's what made the car loose, is as we got to roll, both rear wheels were steering the wrong way. So we went to work and came up with some solutions. Uh, we uh, have something called a rear steer kit, which actually is, looks like that. It's a tie rod. We change out the tie rod and the inner point, we move all the way down to the bottom, as you can see that. And we use the, the existing uh, tie rod end. Now, I've since we've done that, I've seen other people come out with uh, bump steer kits in which they do the same thing they do on the front. They put a pin, they put a pin in the uh, in in the spindle, and then a, a rod end. Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of work to try to figure out how to get where you want to be. So it, it's kind of like the, it's a, I, I do one thing and people copy it, but they do it kind of don't, don't understand it. And because to me, bump steer, bump steer in my mind is the front. When the, when the car is turning and you hit a bump, that movement makes the, the, the wheels kind of steer different. That's why we take bump steer out of the front. So when you turn and hit a bump, wheels keep going the right way. So, you know, to me, bump steer is bump when steering. In the back, it's roll steer. And that's what we, so I, we created this kit. Now, when we do the, uh, the full uh, geometry upgrade on the carrier, we move this inner point down even more. This takes this takes a lot of the, the roll steer out, but when we do the geometry upgrade, we pretty much take all of it out. And this is all part of, I guess it's kind of like our show and tell this morning, all part of our uh, phase one traction kit for IRS cars. And what that includes, includes the, the uh, rear steer kit. And you can see that this is really good quality stuff, high, high grade rod ends. Not, we never ever use cheap rod ends. Everything we do is premium rod ends. And then there's the, uh, the forward torque brace for the differential. Uh, this, is, this replaces the, the hollow tube, vent hollow tube uh, forward brace on the differential. And this is, this is rock solid. I mean, not, that's not moving at all. I mean, it is, you can see, it's a pretty heavy duty built piece. And then the other part is our aluminum diff bushings. Uh, we were, I use aluminum for a number of reasons. One, we can, I can, I can put all these thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, thick uh, washers on there, which makes it kind of like a heat sink. And then also by doing this, we can actually move the pinion angle up instead of it being in the middle, the differential sits on this, actually moves the pinion angle up. And we found back uh, a long time ago that uh, that really helps. I can't remember what year, uh, Cobra, they had uh, some driveline vibration issues, not all of them, just some of them. And we had a customer from, uh, I think it was down in, K in Kentucky maybe, that had been to his dealership you know, multiple times for driveline vibration. Uh, they replaced you know this, that, the drive shaft, all that stuff. And he came to us and all we did was, was put these in. Of course, you put the whole kit in, but we put the pinion angle up and his vibration went away. So this is a really nice start for uh, if, you're, if you get an IRS and you want to start improving it. We call it the phase one traction kit because it actually does help traction, help grip in the back. So, okay, I guess that's my show and tell for the day. Oh, you guys can remember you can send, if you got questions, send them in. You know, through, through your little typing thing through the comments. And uh, uh, what in the world is all this stuff over here? I don't know. I got a bunch of things coming up that I don't I know anything about. Uh, hey, hey, Kenny. Um, yeah. I'm not seeing what you're saying, but uh, we're having, StreamYard is having difficulty uh, streaming directly to Speed Therapy Society. I'm trying to work on that. So that's maybe what you're seeing. Because I got a little box over here. Yeah, don't just ignore hey, it. So automatically streams and there's a there's a, a little button at the bottom that says go live yeah just uh you can click go live but i'm i'm dealing with it on my end so yeah you can just click on the screen it'll go away that won't go away click somewhere else on the screen that went away okay where was i oh we, we were talking about the, the show and tell that the uh the uh phase one uh, traction kit uh, just to continue on that theme, phase two for our IRS package is the tubular rear lower control arms, 
with the coilover shock conversion, either single or double adjustable. Phase three would add the uh, tubular uh, upper control arms, which are less than half the weight of the factory. And phase four is we take the whole carrier, cut all the pickup points off, weld them back on, cut the big ugly mount off the back, and weld on a bracket that's a direct mount to the frame rail. So we, I mean, we're, we're if you're looking for you know help with an IRS Cobra, we're the only people. You get right down to it because we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, okay, so let's go. Let's see. That was uh, okay, Dylan. Uh, how hard is it to convert? We're still in the IRS theme. How hard is it to convert the uh, 99 IRS to a 31 spline? Can you swap out the differential and carrier for a 31 spline and change axles, or is it more involved? Nope, just that simple. All you got to do is get a, a 31 spline differential and 31 spline axles, put it together. Everything else is the same. So there's, it, it, it's, it's pretty easy peasy. But second half of this question, also, I was wondering, what's your preferred style of LSD? Is what your preferred style of LSD is, and what do you think of the Eaton True Track differentials? Well, I got a good answer for you. But let's do a little. Let's look at some differentials. Okay, this is a typical positive attraction differential. Uh, uh, there, it goes from having an open differential, which is just just the the, uh, the, the pinion gears uh, and and nothing to to transfer uh, the torque. And that's you know a lot of the older cars just had open differentials, and you tell an open differential is if, you know you pop the clutch and put your foot down, and you only have one black stripe. That's an open differential. And positive traction is where they use a series of clutches. These would be the clutch plates uh, in a package so that the, the torque that comes through the pinion gear gets uh, distributed to both of the axles, which is, you know, really good. Uh, it's, it's good for street cars, not so good for performance cars. And the reason is, is that at some point, if you got a lot of power drive hard, you're going to burn those those uh, clutch discs up. And I know because back in the Celine days, you know, that's what we had to run. We had to run a stock differential. And so what we did to kind of uh, improve them the best, be best we could, so it last 24 hours, is we took in the, uh, you have to kind of like twist these these uh, gears in, a little path for them to twist in. And what we did is we would, polish the daylights out of it so it's super slick and super smooth and I put some oil on it add one extra clutch disc per side and I have uh, uh, Rex with about a four foot bar on the axle uh, and he will force force these gears in with an extra uh, extra plate and then we wouldn't run any friction modifier and we could get them to last a long time of course the downside to that when you pull back into the pits and driving through the pits, you hear this clunk, 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 clunk. And everybody thinks your rear end's broken. But the weird thing, as soon as you get on track, you start going fast, the clunk goes away. So, I mean, that was the old days. I mean, that, that's still good for, for street cars. But my preference is a torsen. Now, what a torsen is, is it's, it's, there's no clutches. It's just all worm gears. Uh, worm gears and spur gears and the whole concept of the torsen is that through the gears, they will take the torque of the engine and it will direct it to the tire that has the most traction, okay? Uh, unlike the, uh, the positive traction, uh, sometimes it directs the power to the, the uh, tire with the least traction. The torsen uh, directs the power uh, to the to tire that has the most traction, which makes it really cool. Amazingly good in, in any, any IRS should be running a torsen, uh, absolutely or torsen type. Here's another picture that shows the, the worm gears and the spur gears and how they kind of all spin around and work together. Now, the question was for a true track. This is eating true track. And as you can see, it's uh, the same principle as a torsen. You've got worm gears and spur gears. Uh, the difference is it's a little less complicated. Uh, there's, there's fewer gears, but it does the same thing. Uh, and just as kind of an, an FYI on the, when we have uh, Strange Engineering build our nine inch uh, 
road race rear ends for S197s, uh, we use a true track differential on that. So uh, there's a, if you can get a true track uh, fear, a 31 spine true track, it's, it's fine. Absolutely fine. It'll work great. Okay, who we have next? Uh, Omar. So, hello, Kenny. Even though I don't watch your show, I always watch on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, I'm slowly, surely been building my car like you would. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, this is kind of a, this is kind of a, a, a dis, I'm going to have a disappointing answer for you. Building your car like you would, if you can show some of your design for your SLA suspension, I'll be interested in purchasing it. I hope that the price is not that expensive as some of the other designs out there. Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, it's something, it's not ready for the public yet. Uh, it's uh, we're probably six months away or more, but it's a project I started a long time ago, and it's, and it's pretty cool. Now, the, uh, the guys in the Speed Therapy Academy, uh, actually last Thursday night, we kind of went through the, the SLA and the geometry that goes with it. It's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, but uh, I won't be able to show you anything for at least six months to the general public, but it is, it is, is in line for the next major product. So uh, we'll just have to stay in touch in, uh, in, uh, and uh, yeah. So you have a second half of the question. Also, your thoughts on push rod or cantilever suspensions. Okay, well, I can do that. I can answer that question for you. Okay, this is what he's talking about, push rod, pull rod. Now, they are predominantly on open wheel cars, and the reason is to get the, the springs and shocks out of the airstream. <coughs> I'm sorry. In the push rod, as the wheel goes up, it pushes on a cantilever and compresses the shock. On a pull rod, as the wheel goes up, it pulls on the cantilever and compresses the shock. Now, open wheel cars, typically the front is always a push rod, and the rear is typically a pull rod. Uh, as far as you know, putting them on a sedan, uh, and, unless you're building kind of like a fancy show car, I really don't see the need for it. Unless you're using the, unless you're using the uh, uh, the uh, can't the the bracket to, you, what's you, what I'm trying to say, you can you can engineer it so that the uh, the, the bell crank that you're using actually it would be a rising rate, which means it would be, you know, if this goes up an inch, that would go down an inch and a half, it goes up two, you know, three inches. You can do a rising rate on that. Uh, that's that's kind of getting into some, some you know, serious uh, race car uh, engineering. Uh, but for, you know, I, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, cars and magazines that have these fancy suspensions, and they look cool. Uh, as far as their level of effectiveness, I mean, it, it's uh, to, to me, you know, why would you do it? Uh, but other than other than to, to, that's cool and it looks cool. Now you talk about cantilever. I think this is about as as, as much as I can figure out. You're talking about a cantilever because this is actually kind of like a uh, an extended version of, of a push rod. Uh, it it, it kind of goes out and something like this. That's actually looks like the ratio might be a rising rate. Uh, not sure what kind of car it is, but I just found that. And I thought uh, that that might be what you're looking at. Uh, I mean, the cantilever is nothing more than a, a version of the, the, the push rod. So, I mean, it, it's a great, if you're, if you're engineering like an open wheel race car, uh, you have to do that. There's, there's no other way around it. If you're doing like a, uh, like a regular street car, uh, track car, uh, it's, you know, it's. I, I think you'd be better better off uh, focusing effort and resources on other other things that are equal uh, more important. So uh, that's my thoughts on that. Uh, and if you want to, if you want to talk more about that, and be member, you can sign up for one of my fifteen minute consults. Uh, anybody on here or anybody out there, uh, you got a question, need some help with planning your car, uh, so how to make it work better. Uh, just sign up for one of my 50 minutes. The people that have done it are just blown away. They have access to me. And uh, that, that way you're going to get real answers. You, you're not going to get, 
and what somebody said, you know, on the internet. Okay, now we're down to uh, Dan Granza. What, I see, what's uh, the most amount of support brake pad temp you would run with DOT4 for, DOT for brake fluid? Uh, asking for a friend with a 218 Mustang GT. Well, Dan, I didn't know. And so I did some research. And what I found is the, the uh, dry boiling point on uh, a DOT4 fluid is 230 degrees centigrade, which equals 446 Fahrenheit. And that is not enough for a track day car. Uh, I mean, that, that's that'd be fine for the street. I mean, that, that, that worked fine for the street, even hard stops. But when you're on track and you know, your brake temperatures go way up, it, it's gonna fail. Uh, what we use, we just switched to this about a year ago because I think I think it's the best out there, and it costs less than some of the others. Is the uh, the bare brake fluid? Uh, thing about the bare brake fluid, it's got a dry boiling point of 608 degrees, uh, and that is we the other one we we use we have used is Motul, excellent brake fluid uh, that goes to uh, I think uh, 590 something. Uh, this goes over 600 and it's less expensive so there's nothing wrong with a great product it's actually was specially formulated in the uk as a competitor to the castrol the sfr or whatever that is so that's what we switch to and, and if you go on track this is what you really need uh, you need you need high temperature brake fluid so you don't lose your brakes and use the uh, wall to slow the car down okay let's, let's see now the rest of it is uh, now I have a Kenny Brown front grip kit. You're going to love it. Car's going to actually turn. You turn the wheel, car's going to turn. Uh, camera control arms. A freshly built engine and need to dyno. Where would you recommend to tie down the straps on the dyno? Uh, 2011 GT500 heavily modified. Well, I'm going to say that wherever you go to the dyno, they're going to have their preferred method of uh, strapping down uh, the car. Uh, and what we used to do when, I, when we have my shop and we have my dyno, is I made it really simple in the, uh, because all of our cars are so low, you can't get underneath them, is we would take and uh, put the, the front straps around a spoke or two spokes in the wheel and use that to pull the front forward. And then in the back, there was a couple, uh, out, like out by the, uh, the, uh, the brackets on the, on the axle for the lower control arms, we would actually use those and then cross uh, across the straps in the back to keep the car centered. But you get you get to a, a, a dyno place and they're going to have their own preferred method of tying car, cars down. And uh, I would I would stick with uh, what they think uh, because it's on them if it doesn't work. Uh, okay, we're down to our last one. And this is, this is a quandary question for me. Uh, this is Luke and he says, hi, I have a 2005 Mustang GT with a bare brake kit. Do you have a booster or master cylinder to get a better pedal feel. Now that's kind of, you know, I, I kind of, it really caught my attention because we actually in the no, late nineties switched over to bare brakes because of the great pedal feel. Uh, I'd be interested to know in which uh, bare brake package that you have. And you know, a couple other questions would be is that typically they come with uh, this steel braided lines like this. Uh, you know, Teflon steel coated brake lines. Uh, and the reason for that is steel brake lines don't not, not going to expand. Now you have your, your factory rubber brake lines are great. They're, they're always DOT certified. However, you start seeing, you know, a thousand degree uh, brake temperature, 1200 degree brake temperature, everything's going to get hot, including the brake fluid. And, and, and that means that the rubber hoses are going to get hot. As they get hot, I mean, you, what happens when you heat up some rubber? It gets kind of mushy and spongy. Uh, and that would give you a kind of like a not crisp pedal feel because instead of pushing the caliper first, it's going to expand the rubber and that's going to be gushy. Uh, so that's why we use these. You put these on and boom, you got a really hard pedal. Uh, I'd also take a look at the 2005, uh, you know, maybe you actually need a master cylinder. Uh, I mean, that's something you, instead of changing something else. First, 
check and see if your master sounds okay. I, I should back up and say, first, make sure you bleed the brakes really, really well. I mean, you got to bleed them to get all that air out. Uh, it's really important. And the teeniest bit of air will give you a soft pedal. So that's uh, there, there, there's a couple of uh, a couple of tips. Again, more questions, sign up for a 15-minute, and I'll talk through with it for you. So that, I think we're through the, the main uh, main part of, of today. And you notice that uh, I talk about what you want to know about. So if you have questions or subjects you want me to, to talk about on, on Cars and Coffee, send them in through the Speed Therapy Society. And if you're not a member, please join the Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society private Facebook group. Got every single word in. Uh, there's a lot of great people there, great information to share. So uh, with that, I should, I should say, for anybody who came in really late, I'm Kenny Brown. This is Cars and Coffee. And uh, we're, you guys are learning today. And uh, I always try to teach you something that's, that's going to be of real value. So uh, we're up to uh, uh, questions. That's what we're up to, questions. Uh, Brad, have we got any questions out there? Yes, we do. So um, let me start. Um, well, Dan, Dan Ramza was the first question, but I think we um, covered his. Um, the next one is Andrew, who's viewing on YouTube. I'm interested in your magnet brake bleeder bottle. Can you teach me how to bleed brakes for a track day with only one person using the bottle? Uh, okay, yeah. Let's, I mean, what you need to do, if it's only one person, here's, a, here's an idea. They do have uh, bleeder valves that are check valves. Uh, you can you can screw it in. It's, it's like you know, it's a one man bleed show. Uh, you put it in, you loosen it up, you, you pump the brakes, and the check valve will keep the thing from com coming back out. I think that'd be the one of the easiest ways. We can check we can check check into the check valve for you. Uh, that would be one thing. The other thing is that you just have to free pump it, uh, and if you free pump it enough, you're going to use a little more brake fluid. But if you free pump it enough then uh, you're going to get pretty much get the air out. Uh, it still would be handy at the, at the very end uh, to have somebody give you a hand, uh, sit in the car and pump it up. But so there's, there's two ways. One, you can get the, the one-way uh, bleeder, bleeder valves uh, for the brakes, so the check, to the check valve, or you can just free pump it uh, and then check and, and make, make sure everything is clear. So that, how about that? And of course, use good brake fluid. And so we don't have a ton of questions today, but we have another one from Scott Newton, who's joining us on Facebook and I'll show it on screen. His question is 99 to 04 IRS aluminum housing. What is the power limit before I would need to find an iron T-bird housing? And then he has a second question for a car that needs mostly or sees mostly street use, but does go to the drag strip on occasion, I'm looking at the Eaton True Track or the Wave Track differential. Would one have noticeable differences to justify the price? Uh, okay. Well, the as far as you know, how much power the uh, IRS aluminum will take. I mean, it it, it, it depends. I know the. The drag racing guys like to blow them up all the time. Uh, we've got people with uh, that are running uh, six, 600, 650 horsepower on track. Okay, you're not getting the shock load you would with a uh, uh, with a, uh, a a drag racing application. But you know, we've got guys running you know 600 horsepower with 31 spline and torsen, and uh, they're doing pretty well. So what the upper upper limit is, I don't know. You might have to find uh, somebody that's uh, into drag racing, drag races, the IRS cars, and they could give you an answer on that. Uh, what was I mean? Second half of the question. Let's see. A wave track or true track? Uh, either, I mean, the wave track we've used in the live axle cars, uh, and the reason for that, but we can't get them anymore. I think they're they're not making them for for the live axle uh, Mustangs anymore. Uh, the reason we use that is because it's a great difference. It's like a torsion, 
but it's kind of different because the carrier inside the differential there is this kind of like this this wavy thing and it'll actually ro roll up on the uh on the uh instead of being a solid it kind of rolls up on these little bumps and what we ran into with uh with the like the 11 to 14s is when we put our suspension on the back and used all you know spherical bearing rod ends because that gives you the absolute best articulation what we found is that a standard torsion under D cell would get totally confused. Uh, it wouldn't know what to do, and it would keep shifting the, the power back and forth, which kind of first started happening, kind of an unnerving feeling. Uh, I pulled into pits, we checked everything, and did it again, and I figured out the wave for the uh, torsion trying to figure out. The newer ones don't do that as much, uh, and the wave track doesn't do it at all because as soon as you go into D cell, rather than switch a torque or roll up on one of those things. As far as on an IRS car, uh, well, I, I, I think the, I don't know if the wave track is worth the money. It's a great differential, don't get me wrong. Uh, I, I had it in my car and I loved it. The only problem we had with, with the wave track is taking it out. They've got the C-clips, or I mean, in fact, that this, it was such a tight fit that I did not, I, I could run big brake kit on an 8.8. Uh, without any other modification, because the wave track was so tight that the uh, you know we didn't get any knockback on the on the rear pads. But when you go to take it apart and service it, I mean you just couldn't get those C clips out. I mean they you know the tool they gave you to pull them out was ridiculous and didn't work. So I, mean, I think that's why they you know they stopped making them for the Mustangs. But it's it's a good it's a good one. I mean it's I mean the the you know the True Track is going to work every bit as good and it's probably a little less money. So, so there we go. Okay, so the next one is uh, Dan Gramza. Do you carry speed bleeders for the S550 Mustang brakes? I have them on my 2011 through S197. Kenny, if I remember correctly, Russell brand makes the speed bleeders that we used previously. I think they're owned by Holly, and Holly is a vendor of ours, so we should be able to find those. Yeah. Uh, we don't carry them right now. Certainly, uh, why, don't you, why don't you send a note into Rich, uh, uh, info at KennyBrown.com, uh, in case I forget, and uh, we'll, we'll look that up for you. Okay. The next one is Kobe. Does the bare brake fluid have a dye in it like ATE Super Blue? If not, how can you tell that you have all the old brake fluid out of the system? Okay, no, this is actually kind of clear, and that that's a really good question. Uh, when you when you after you've been on track and you bleed your brakes, when you start, you're going to notice that the fluid has a little bit of a darkish tone to it, and you just keep bleeding, and at some point, it's going to go from a dark tone to clear. As soon as it goes to clear, then you know you've got all the fluid out. So it's just a matter of color. And having the clear, it's it's you know it looks kind of like a little dingy. Uh, and, and it depends on how long it's been in there, how hot it got. But you know, the way you can tell if it's all out is as soon as that the color changes from discoloration to clear, then you're good to go. Anybody else? Hello, I'm back. Always a tech issue. So we we have uh, everything resolved. Uh, Brad, I'll let you keep going. But it looks like um, if we have we have a couple more questions. It looks like Brad, I'll let you continue so you know where you are. But if you have any more questions, this is last call for questions. Um, so make sure you uh, add your questions so Kenny can answer them. Um, Kenny, have you talked about next week as far as uh, what we're doing the next two weeks for the holiday? Uh, actually, no, I haven't. Okay, well, why don't I talk about that? Unless you want to. No, nope, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so uh, for the next uh, two weeks, since it's a holiday weekend, Kenny is not going to be live, but what he is doing is taking his top 10 uh, tips of the year um, and going to be running them on uh, both uh, next Saturday, which is Christmas, and on Christmas Day, uh, or no, New Year's Day. So anyway, uh, make sure you tune in for that. You won't want to miss out on that. It's top 10 tips of 2021. Um, and if you have any, uh, if you want to add right now, so you, if you have any uh, ideas uh, or 
what you think should be Kenny, one of Kenny's top uh, 10 tips, uh, add them to the comments area. We would appreciate your, your input. Um, Kenny has his ideas already, but we'd like to hear what other people think he should be talking about. So add those in there. Um, let's see, Brad, do you have any other questions? I'm not going to, I didn't mean to barge in, but Kenny, I thought you'd like to know I was back. Well, glad to have you back. And glad you got the te technical thing resolved. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Never, never, ever. So, okay. Brad, do you have any other questions? Um, I can't hear you, Brad. You're muted. We don't have any more questions. Um, all the people who are viewing today are slacking off quite a bit. So, um, <laughs> and K Calvin just joined us. So he's another slacker. Um, <laughs> we can say so, that about Calvin. He used to work for us. So, yeah. I think so yeah you, you wanted to know how the PRI show was. Uh, we, we didn't go. I mean, it just uh, it carries back. Uh, she's still, you know, uh, quasi bedridden. So, and I just didn't want to go by myself. And uh, so we, we didn't go. We talked to some other people who went that said it was really nice, but I don't have any more information on it. Uh, next year we'll go, hopefully. Uh, we have a couple um, questions coming in here. Uh, so Brad, I'll, do you want to take them over and I'll just sit back and interrupt you like I do? <laughs> so. Yep. Okay. I'll so the next question is from Steve Bailey. I just put it up on the screen. Is the twitchy tram lining front steering on the S550 GT350 normal? And if so, if not, is there a remedy for that? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, be honest. I haven't heard of that yet. Uh, that's that's a good question. We do have uh, a, a couple of guys with GT350s that are not racing them, but doing a lot of track days. Uh, I'm not sure what the the tram lining front steering means. Twitchy, I can understand, uh, but tram line, uh, you know, I, I think without knowing exactly what you're talking about, uh, I think you. Uh, what about alignment? Because uh, not having the alignment quite right can make things kind of weird. You're going to want. Uh, uh, if it's on track, you're going to want about two and a half, two and a half degrees negative camber, maximum caster. And, uh, oh, you know what? Uh, one of the questions I was supposed to ask about the uh, toe-in for the, yeah, on Rob, bump steer, part two, uh, what the, the, uh, uh, the toe-in in, in degrees. Oh, sorry about that. I missed the other half of your question. And then, uh, for the for the rear on a 99 Cobra, you're going to want to run around 1.2 negative camber and 1/16th toe in on an alignment machine that would be uh, minus 0.25 to minus 0.3, so a 16th total toe in at the back, uh, and then 1.2 negative camber. Uh, so, but getting back to uh, the 550, if it's a track car, you know, 2.5 negative camber max caster and a 16th toe out. Okay, toe in at the back, toe out at the front. That helps turn in. Uh, so that, that's what I checked. And aside from that, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I mean, you can sign up for 15 minute. We can talk through it a little more. Uh, I, I don't think uh, Joe, who, who does a lot of a lot of track days with his uh, GT350 has, has mentioned that. So there's, there's, something, there's something going on. And uh, uh, you, you know, give me a call. We'll try to figure out what it is and, and help you get past it. So, anybody else? Okay, the next one is, well, let's go back. Um, Cliff Glidden's got a good question, but I want to go back to that. Um, Dam Granza says, tram lining is where the car pulls side to side when you're in a rut on the road. So that's different. Ah. That's, that's not, that's sort of steering, not steering, that's alignment. Um, and caster, I, I think. So can you elaborate maybe? Yeah. Now? Uh, okay. What, what's happening, if you got a lot of camber, you, you probably don't have enough caster, number one. Uh, secondly, I mean, I ran into that in one of my, one of our cars. We gave the magazines up in Detroit. And because I had really sticky tires on it and the, the ruts up there are pretty big and I had an aggressive alignment, it wanted to do that rut thing. But uh, I mean, all you can do is just you know, try to get the alignment right. And if you've got adjustable shocks, make sure you've got those adjusted right. 
Uh, and yeah, if, if you got sticky tires, it's not unusual because they're not slipping, they're just sticking. So yeah, the uh, alignment, I, I'd go right to the alignment and, and see what you got. Zero toe on the front. Yeah, you don't want zero. You either want toe in or toe out. Uh, you get zero and the thing will wander. So we always run toe out, toe out in the front and toe in in the back. Okay. You said uh, Cliff had something. Yeah, here's a Brad. If you're Brad, if you're talking, you're offline, so you need to add. I'll add you to the st stream. There you go, Brad. If you were talking, you need to repeat yourself. Okay. Yeah. So um, Dan uh, Dan made a comment that um, correct my tram lining went away when I put Kenny's front end in, and of course that's adding a lot of caster. So, um, Ken. Okay. You said uh, the cliff had something. Yeah. So Cliff's um, got a, a really good question here. Um, about starting the race car. So we talked about this a few weeks ago when we um, went over winterizing. I don't think Cliff was there. So maybe you can go back over um, storing the car for the winter because that's a really good subject. Okay, I, I will. And I also, I saw something from Joe uh, uh, that, uh, what do you say? Oh, he, he's, he's, he's running uh, my alignment setup and it works great. Okay, here's the storing a car. First of all, I would put it on jack stands. Uh, just take the weight off of everything. Uh, and you need to store the tires, if it's race tires, in a heated garage or area. You never want to let race tires go under like, like freezing. Uh, what happens is the, the way the design, if you had a race tire and it, was, and it was like 25 degrees and you tried to drive, the tire would shatter. So you always want to keep your race tires in uh, a warm area for the winter. What I do is I always change the oil so there's fresh oil in there. Uh, if, it's, if it's in a heated garage, then you don't have to worry about antifreeze. But the other thing I would do is I would have the gas tank full with some uh, uh, like gas pr preserver in there. And, you know, aside from that, I mean, the, you know, it's, you, you could get, start getting things ready for spring by you know, changing some, some of your other fluids. But uh, that's the most important thing is up in the air, uh, fresh oil, fresh oil filter. Uh, and, and believe it or not, when I do that, uh, I'll run it for a little bit and then change oil again, just in case some stuff got in. Because what you want to do, you want to protect against moisture. And I think full gas tank is not going to have room to collect moisture. And fresh oil is not going to collect moisture. I, I've seen cars that have, you know, have miles on them and they've stored them like in, in the wintertime in cold spots. And they have, you take the engine apart and you see like in the bearings, these like almost like a little worm was in there. And that's from the, the water and the oil turns to acid and, and it eats stuff up. So yeah, a tire's in a warm place, fresh oil, fresh oil filter. Uh, if it's, if it's not in a heated garage, put some coolant in. I mean, you don't have to fill the whole thing up with coolant. Uh, just, just enough to make sure any water that's in there is protected. Full tank of gas with, uh, a stabilizer, gas stabilizer, and then just sit on a chair and wish it was spring. Okay. And then um, Herstifer had a question. Can you hear me, Ken? Yeah. Okay. So Herstifer has a question. So fresh oil in the spring as well um, after yeah. the car stored. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like oil is one of those things you, you can't change your oil too often. So you know, the answer would be yes. It's just like you can't bleed your brakes too much and you can't change your oil too much. And Dylan concurred with your statement about um, storing the car in uh, cold weather um, if it's not in a heated garage to drain the water out and replace it with antifreeze or, or if nothing else, I think, put antifreeze in. Is that right? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if, if you're being stored, you drain all the water out. And then put, you don't have to fill the whole thing up with antifreeze uh, because all you want to do is you want to put enough antifreeze in there that any water that's left in there is uh, mixed in with the antifreeze. 
I mean, you could fill it all the way up if you want, but it wouldn't be really necessary. Okay, we have anybody else this morning? We have no more questions this morning, so I'm relying on Kerry to jump in and um, help us out here. Okay, so I am back on. Uh, so again, if this is last call for any questions you have for Kenny, um, I just thought to share a little personal note and see what you guys are doing. If you're celebrating Christmas, what are you guys doing? Are you uh, hosting Christmas? Are you traveling? Um, and if you're traveling, where are you going to? Uh, we have just had a change in plans with Christmas. Um, we found out our little granddaughter has COVID and we just, uh, we haven't been seeing her because of my back. Um, um, but we saw her on Wednesday, so now we are quarantining as well. So uh, we are spending Christmas alone again last year because of COVID, and now this year we'll probably be quarantining. So um, wish us all well, and uh, like to know what you guys are doing. Um, we love the Christmas holidays between Christmas and New Year's. It's always a great time of year. So are there any more questions? I can tell you what, what we're doing for Christmas. I haven't told you this yet. Oh, you haven't? Okay. I thought about it. I, I, and the other day, I was digging through the freezer, uh -huh. and I found kind of like a small little uh, a roast from the uh, beef tenderloin that we got and broke down a long time ago. Cool. So we may be having kind of like, like a mini Chateaubriand for, for Christmas Day. Oh, that's great. That sounds yummy. Um, Along with uh, 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 Brussels sprouts, uh, with Brussels sprouts and bacon. That's, that's to die for. So um, if you haven't guessed, Kenny is our cook in our family. That is his uh, hobby. Is cooking, and, my, and my job. Cooking and gardening and, and things like that. I call him the male uh, Martha Stewart. Um, he, his uh, cooking is incredible. Um, so we always have a great meal. And he always does a great job of messing up the kitchen as well. It looks like we may have another question coming in, Kenny. Uh, Calvin says that he's having a quiet dinner with his mom and cat. Oh, that's sweet. That is sweet. Uh, always spending time with family is great. Looks like, oh, there are some more questions, uh, comments coming in that we do, they're just a little late. Um, okay. I, I see something from Brian. Yeah, from Brian. And we'll go over that. How um, well do your 9604K members do on a streetcar? Also, I noticed that you use square steel versus round tubing compared to others I've seen. Is there any reason uh, you went to square? Yeah, I just, I just, I, I like square tubing for, uh, for uh, like K members. Uh, control arms are, are round tubing, but I, I feel that we can get more strength out of straight steel. I and mean, some of the others that use tubing, you notice the tubing's bent. Uh, well, bent tubing is any, if you got tubing in it, a bend in it, that that bend spot can be a, can be a, a weak spot under load. So we went with you know square tubing, everything straight, everything's triangulated, and uh, it you know it works great. And what was the other part of the question on a street cart? Well, here's the thing: is all my suspension pieces, no matter what I have, is designed for the street, but it's totally competent on track. Okay, uh, we use for the, for the K we use urethane bushings in the front. Uh, we don't use Delrin uh, that's for a number of different reasons. That's a different conversation. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's that, that's most of our people that run the front came and run it on the street. And, of course, you do have to convert to coilover uh, because we eliminate the uh, the spring on uh, spring on control arm and go to a straight coilover. What you guys know that all I ever all I ever put on cars is coilovers. And we actually have a tremendous coilover package for the S and 95s, which actually can can work on the Fox. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, everybody's got a different way of engineering things. Uh, it's just like the uh, the uh, uh, forward brace on the uh, Cobra is round tubing and it's, and it's curved. Well, that's square tubing and it's straight and solid as a rock. So I, it's just a matter of preference. Uh, you know, I, I've been engineering and building race cars since the 70s, and I've uh, over the years I've developed. Uh, what I feel are the, are the best uh, techniques and methods. Uh, in fact, the, the guys that are in the academy, uh, Speed Therapy Academy, we went through and uh, went through the whole thing on uh, on chassis, chassis design, uh, and uh, you know, from formula cars to race cars to carbon fiber, 
and uh, it, it just it's a matter of preference. I mean, I, I like I, I personally I think the square has has a more robust look to it. Uh, I just uh, that, that the K member is not not something I would I want to use round tubing on. So uh, hope that answers your question. So, and also you forgot to add, Kenny, to that is one of your philosophies is if, if you need to take uh, whatever uh, manufacturers or suppliers uh, philosophy and stick with that, not mix and match parts. Uh, yeah, that, and that's something we talk about in, in, uh, in, in the workshops and in the academy. That, you know, the, the best thing is <clears throat> find, find one of the manufacturers slash suppliers and you know, it, find find a philosophy you like, okay? And if find a philosophy you like, stick with it. Uh, the reason is, is the worst the worst calls I get from people is, you know, my car doesn't handle right, and we start going down the list of parts, and they got springs here, they got shocks there, they got control arms here, they got you know like five different manufacturers. When you do that, you're actually doing your own R and D program to see what happens when you put this combination together. And it's almost impossible for me to really help people. I can talk theory, uh, but that's about it because I mean, I've, I've never done that and I've never done that combination. So I don't know the actual results Now, everything that I do. I mean, I know what the results are. In fact, in, in our, our parts program, the only parts we have, we don't have parts like from, you know, from uh, 10 different people. They're all my parts. And they come directly from the car program. What I use to build the cars is what's in our car pro in our, in our parts program. That way, we can give uh, the, you know some of the best technical support in the industry. Uh, you know, you call in, just doing this, is doing that. You know, I, I know it's in, you know, it's in the car. I, I can give you some good direction. So if, it, if it's my philosophy, stick with it. If it's somebody else you you like better, stick with them. Just do everything with them because if you have a problem, then you have somebody to call. And, and get it worked out. So, okay. So, um, first of all, before I forget, I want to thank Brad uh, for filling in. We have a really strong team, and uh, we typically have two people on every show. So, Brad, thank you for filling in for me. I know you always do a great job. Uh, here's some interesting things, Kenny. Um, do, is there another question there, Brad? I saw you throw something up that I missed. I hear here. Uh, here's Brian. He says, "On coilers, do you find the rear shock towers on 9904 Cobras break or tear from the force? Do you have a solution for this?" Uh, yes and yes. We ha we haven't actually seen that. Although in the in the last academy, I think Ben uh, showed some pictures he found on the internet of the the shock towers just you know breaking away. We actually, when we started doing coilovers back in 2000. I believe uh, we created a rear shock tower brace that goes between the two shock towers, has a triangulation, it bolts in the middle. So we reinforce the shock tower braces and it's, it's a really popular product. I mean, that a lot of, I mean, it, 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 it looks good. It works good and it's, it's easy to install. So yeah, we, they will do that. And that's why we went to the rear shock. Every, every car we do SN95 with IRS has a rear shock tower brace on it. Okay, here's what people are doing for the holidays, Ken. I um, want to share some of that with you because I think that's pretty cool. A lot of these are uh, people that have been on here almost every week of your show. We have a lot of really solid people. Um, so Dan Gramza says he's having um, having the annual SCCA Milwaukee Regents Christmas party at his house this Sunday. Go Packers! Now I'm That's a Vikings cool. fan. Yeah, I'm a Vikings fan, Dan. So I don't know if I'm going to say go Packers, but I don't think they're playing the Vikers. Vikings, so I will say go Packers. Um, the other thing, uh, Dan, why don't you say hi to everybody from Kenny and myself? Um, that's that's really cool that you're having everybody over. Wish we could join you. Uh, here's Kobe Ward making a brisket on the smoker for the family. Food is love. Ah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm with you there. Hey, I I got I got kind of a, a cooking thing. Uh, something I do in the winter is I make some of the most amazing soups you've ever tasted. Uh, and if you guys like, I, I, I can put some little videos together on how to make soups to die for. That's a good, that's a good line. Soups to die for. <laughs> and Carrie can attest to that. I mean, oh my gosh. You, you talk about flavor town on steroids. Uh, 
Yeah, it's it's pretty good, and he's he's sounds like he's bragging, but his soup is really good. I mean, I've never tasted anything better. Okay, the next comment and we yeah, have. If, if you want, I can do a little video and show you guys how to make killer soups. So anyway, uh, Kobe, uh, that sounds wonderful. And food is love. Um, we we see that all the time with because that's what Kenny puts into his food. Um, Dale Chandler, what time is dinner? He's asking you, Kenny. Joe Johnson, uh, he's going down to Houston this afternoon to see President Trump and Bill O'Reilly. Go, Joe. <laughs> That sounds great. Um, also, um, Cliff Glidden. Oh, my gosh, Cliff, we need to join you for this. Filet mignon on a Traeger grill, a little champagne. Woo! Champagne salad, uh, spinach salad with cranberries, chopped nuts, and orange squares. Come on over. So, if you I'm want allergic to, to cranberries. <laughs> hey, Cliff. I can't eat at Cliff's house. <laughs> hey, Cliff, I have got an awesome recipe for cranberries. Uh, it's my cranberries been been rogue. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it, yeah. We should just have a, a, a cooking. Um, well, I'll, I'll just tell you what it is. You know, you put the cranberries <laughs> in the pot, and then I'll put like uh, you know like a regular bag of cranberries, and I put like a cup of half of sugar, and then a cup of good red wine, and then I'll go through and make a whole bunch of like zest strips off of an orange and stick that in there, and just let it cook until it's as thick as you want. You got to taste it periodically because every batch of cranberries is different uh, to adjust the sugar. But uh, I mean, it cooked it about three hours. It, it'll blow your mind. Uh, and I use just about half of an orange of uh, I use like the thing for for, for cocktails for, for making strips off a of lemon. And I just do it off the orange. But just real simple uh, cranberries, red wine, sugar and orange strips. And uh, yeah, you, yeah it, it, it'll blow you away. <laughs> Maybe we should be calling this cooking with Kenny. Um, if you get Kenny talking cooking, obviously you see what happens. Um, I just want to bring up another note uh, that uh, next two weeks, uh, we Kenny's going to picking his top 10, actually I was at, as most of them, top 10 tips of 2021. So make sure you stay tuned on Christmas Day and New Year's Day to listen to that. He will not be live, but it will be pre-recorded. And uh, make sure you, you uh, listen to that. It should be pretty good. And we wish you all a great holiday. But here's a couple more comments uh, after Cliff's, let's see, uh, Joe Johnson. Uh, make Oh, Herstopher says, Joe Johnson, make sure to send my regards to Trump. Um, that's pretty cool, Herstopher. And then Brian Gott, we already went through that. Uh, this is just a link here. It's Dave Robinson, I will be working on our home renovations, but we're heading to the in-laws for Christmas Eve and day. Wishing all the KB gang a very Merry Christmas and happy, healthy, and prosperous new year. Oh, that is so sweet, uh, Dave. And you are on here. Dave is uh, from Niagara, uh, in the Ni Niagara Falls on the Canada side. You can. He's with us every week. Uh, Dave, I don't think you've missed one, have you? Might want to comment on that. Uh, Rory, uh, soups with Kenny Brown. <laughs> Rory. Yeah, I, I can tell you the uh, the two that are, are, people think are the best is my Italian sausage soup. <laughs> and then also I do uh, uh, white bean chicken chili and I do something I call a Southwest chicken stew. And uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're good. They're good. Now, again, I wasn't listening to Kenny. Did you mention your um, uh, Italian sausage soup? Yeah, I mentioned that first. Okay, okay cool. Maybe that I'll, I'll, next batch of Italian sausage soup will make a little video. Okay. Because it's, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's so good. We used to give it away to the relatives for Christmas, and they were just, you know, waiting. You know, that one of the things they look forward to is getting some Italian sausage. Soup. Actually, this is the only year we haven't done it. It's because of my back. We we do that annually, along with your cranberry. Cranberries. Room. Yeah, we send up my cranberries and Italian sausage soup. And uh, I, I make some. Family favorite. And some toffee, my toffee. Oh, and yeah. Carrie's toffee. My God. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, Dylan says, I'd love some new recipes for soup. Would definitely uh, nice for sick family members rather than being stuck, in, stuck to chicken noodle. Um, ah, uh, Brad, I'm switching out for them chop dates. <laughs> so, Brad, you're still excited. You're still excited to Cliffs. Um, Holy Ward, Kenny Brown's Holiday Cookbook. <laughs> this is fun. Uh, Kenny, that sounds awesome. I'll try it. Try it. Hunger now. We could bench race over a gallon of that. Uh, <laughs> 
And uh, Kobe says, I'm, I'll be dumping in a mock up IRS into a Capri. Oh, that's what, uh, that's what you're going to be doing over the Christmas holiday. That sounds like a productive project. So anyway, I think that's all we have to, today, Kenny. So um, I feel bad. We're not going to be on the next couple of weeks, but the top 10 uh, tips of 2021 should be quite good. You'll enjoy that. So make sure you tune in for that. And also, if you want a 15 minute, <laughs> I'll keep talking while Kenny coughs. <laughs> Um, if you want to schedule a 15 minute consult with Kenny, uh, we will be in uh, the office at least part time uh, through the holidays. So you can schedule a, a time and Kenny will give you a call if you have any questions on that. And then uh, Dave Robinson. Uh, this is cool. I have missed maybe three weeks since the start. Last one was last was one uh, that that only happened because I let the missus make the car service appointment. <laughs> That's good. So yeah, and you you got to go with that. I know <laughs> you're uh, you're forgiven. <laughs> I wonder if that's a hint, Dave, that she doesn't want you watching the show every every Saturday at ten o'clock, or yeah, ten o'clock Eastern time. So anyway, the, we're having a lot of fun here. Let's see. Uh, Colby Ward says, "Happy holidays to everyone. See you next year." Oh yes, it is. It's so sad. It's already twenty twenty one has passed. I'm happy because I've been down with back injuries most of the year. So I'm hoping for a great 2022. Um, Kenny, I'm talking most of the time. So let's turn it back to the Kenny Brown show. Uh, Rory, what's he saying? He's having jambalaya. Oh, jambalaya. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I like that. Uh, it's something that it depends on what the ingredients are. Uh, Kerry gets migraines and sometimes the jambalaya has a lot of uh, nitrates and other things like that. Just can't eat. I like it. But sometimes I carry can't eat that, but it's that, that, that sounds good too. Sounds really good. <laughs> okay. okay, Kenny. Okay. Well, I guess there's nothing else. We'll wrap up for the day. And uh, why, don't, why don't I just try to make some, uh, do some soup stuff over the holidays and uh, we can, we can put that on, you know, one of the channels or something. Uh, so, Kenny, you have to realize I still have back issues. I may not be, able, I'm the one behind the scenes. I may not be able to help you with that. So uh, <laughs> but we'll try to get it out there. Some, sometime while it's still winter, we'll, we'll do some soups. That sounds really good. Okay. Anybody have anything else? This is your last chance. Otherwise, we're going to say uh, so long and uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Uh, you know, and everybody say happy and healthy uh, over the holidays. And uh, I, I can't believe it's going to be. 2022 shortly. I mean, uh, I just don't know where this year went and it just kind of like disappeared on me. So anyway, uh, have a Merry Christmas. We will see you next year. That's kind of weird saying that. And uh, I'll, I'll try to at some point put some uh, soup videos together. And uh, if you, you can, you can just absolutely amaze your, your, uh, your significant other and friends with these soups. So have a, have a good, uh, have a good holiday and we will see you next year. Goodbye for now. <laughs>